yeah, I, I can talk loud anyway, so it's fine. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Vaida. I, I make small experimental games about uh, mental health and relationships. I design short personal games. I uh, organize events in Edinburgh relating to game development. And I'm here to get uh, a little bit personal about games. So, uh, in the past few years, there has been an increase in uh, accessible tools and visibility of small game makers. So, um, sites like this, uh, itch.io, uh, are very good at hosting games very easily. Uh, there are tools such as Construct and Twine that make it very easy for non-tech people to make games. And that means that people for, from very different fields are able to come into games and make games that are not usually what you would expect them to be. And um, also you're able to make games without having to commit a lot of time, um, without having to learn a lot of tools and without needing it to be commercial. You can just make a game for yourself. So that's what I want to talk uh, to you about today is that there's a bunch of really interesting personal autobiographical games that are being brought forward. And um, I think that they have benefits for people and um, both players and developers. So that's what I want to talk to you about. So first of all, uh, what is a personal game? Of course, it's a bit hard to define things, you know, uh, what are games, are games art? And, um, well, the definition that I really like is this uh, um, tweet. Uh, what if we made games about these fantasies? Enjoying company of others, people being glad to see you, being proud of someone else. So, um, this tweet really encompasses, for me, what personal games are. They're games that are not afraid of vulnerability, uh, they deal with topics you wouldn't often see in blockbuster games, and most importantly, whether they are abstract or not, you can still really feel the author uh, being present in that game. So, um, just a few examples. Uh, this is a game made in Twine, so it's a bit like a website that you navigate, so if you've played uh, Choose Your Own Adventure games, it's kind of a this idea, people make uh, interactive poetry with it, and it's called Scarf Memory, uh, and it's about losing your scarf on the bus. Uh, it's very short, but it dwells into subjects such as uh, time passing and people changing, so all of, all of the deep stuff. And um, this is another game, really, really beautiful, uh, called uh, Liebe Oma, sorry for my very bad Dutch, uh, and it's about going uh, mushroom hunting in the forest with your grandma. So the title actually means uh, Dear Grandma. And it's very relaxing because as you walk around, there's not much to do. You can just pick up mushrooms and so on. But your grandma starts um, talking to you. She says, oh, you seem a bit off. What's happening? And um, well, it turns out that you're not doing very well with your family. And so you just have a conversation. But it's never pushy. Like you're just able to talk it out and... This is a very good example of a personal game. Um, so how do developers and players actually uh, benefit from these games? So uh, I'm gonna first kind of look at developers and look into their design process. So uh, when you're designing any kind of game, actually, you're kind of thinking, okay, I have a bunch of experiences, I want the player to feel a certain amount of things, but I need to put these things into a game format. So you have to have, I don't know, mechanics, visuals, audio. You cannot just write something out. You, you just have to make it interactive to some extent. So that means that you have to translate uh, emotions and feelings into mechanics and interactions. And this is where it becomes interesting because uh, I'm going to make the claim that going through designing a personal game uh, is a way to sometimes process an experience and can be a form of self-care. So, uh, there's an article that I really like uh, called uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is for Hackers. And I'd like to read out, uh, it, it's, it's a very good article, uh, and uh, I'd like to read out a, a small quote. Um, Cognitive behavioral therapists mirror hackers in how they see the world and approach problems. They share the same core values, an emphasis on problem solving as uh, efficiently and effectively as possible, using logic to debug a system, gathering data to test out what works and what doesn't. So that, that kind of makes you think about games a bit, you know? Um, so let's look at um, a very basic uh, game principle. So um, the, a feedback loop. So uh, when you're playing, let's say, Mario, you, um, you're like, okay, I'm figuring this out. I press the jump button. That's an action. You have an effect. You have a visual. Uh, Mario jumps up. You have a sound. Uh, you can see that other blocks are affected and so on. So uh, the reason why this is satisfying is that you get this feedback from the game. And so uh, if you really want to boil down games to their core, they kind of 
all about figuring stuff out. So uh, if you're playing competitively, it might be figuring out how to optimize your score. Uh, in narrative games, let's say uh, Gone Home, they might be about understanding the story and expanding the story. So this is a very uh, fluid definition. So uh, as a designer, as you start thinking um, about uh, games and designing them uh, in, in terms of personal games, you might think, okay, how do I use this? And then um, communicate thoughts, thought patterns, changes in emotional states through feedback loops. Like, how do you give the player an experience where you, they can try to figure out things and it actually helps them out too? So this is so far very, very abstract. So let's actually look at, uh, at an example. So uh, this is a game called uh, What Now by Ariel Grimes. And uh, it happens on this one screen. Um, all you can do is that you can walk around. Uh, and as you walk around, you start glitching out. So uh, the, the visuals start to contract. Mm, the, the audio becomes like lots of white noise. It's kind of really uncomfortable. But as you approach certain objects that are in the game, so for example, uh, th this um, library, and then you also have um, like a sofa, a desk, and uh, as you approach those objects, you kind of stop glitching out, like the world becomes a bit nicer, and the, the journal does update. And um, as you uh, walk from object to object, each one of them only has this uh, positive use once. And uh, that's really interesting because as, as you s start the game, at, at first you don't really know what's happening, but as you walk around, you kind of realize what the game is trying to communicate to you. Like, uh, actually, each object is a source of comfort, and this game is kind of about, uh, well, you can interpret it differently, but it's kind of about panic attacks and just uh, sensory overload. And uh, it represents it all through just uh, a few core mechanics. And uh, the, the feedback is clearly really important in this game for figuring out how to, how to communicate it to the player. So, uh, this image like it very much, stock imagery. Um, um, uh, the game is very short. It literally takes two minutes to play, but uh, that's the perfect length for it. Uh, uh, why? Because when you're making very tiny personal games, you cannot afford to have cluster. You cannot afford to have lots of extra features. You really need to not distract the player and focus on simple core mechanics. And uh, in what now, as we saw, it's all just about walking around, like technically, as a player, all you can do is walk around and you can either choose to walk uh, towards an object or walk just n not towards an object. And all that's changing is just the visuals, the audio. So everything that is essential to the experience is there and there's nothing else to it. So what, why does that even matter? Like that seems, okay, that's simple development kind of strategy. How does that actually help the developer? So this uh, is a quote by the actual developer uh, of um, What Now? And she says, games have always sort of just been there for me, uh, not purely as escapism, but also in a very productive way. They help me deal with my struggles and understand and prioritize goals. So um, this kind of does start sounding a bit like self-care. So um, here's another game. I'll talk about it a bit later. Um, so I strongly believe that uh, when you're able to deconstruct a personal experience into uh, small mechanics like that, into core components, and kind of understand how they influence each other, so for example, for a feedback loop, you are able to um, become more self-aware about what was happening. For, for example, uh, in terms of like the games I make, I like to make games about mental health, and mental health is always like changing shape and just weird and annoying sometimes and uh, what helps me by when I put them into mechanics is that I'm able to really deconstruct how the different um, factors interact with each other and because I have to have this like game vision um, like game perspective uh, I have to look at it in a different way like see things as being just like pieces and atoms interacting with each other and uh, by and do, do, do. I lost my thing. Yeah, things we interact with each other. Um, yeah, in, in my case, mental health um, and stuff, and relationships also involve dynamics and so on. So that's also quite um, intuitive to then transform into uh, game mechanics. And um, uh, the interview uh, about the, this game is uh, really interesting to me. It's a personal game uh, created by Humblegrove called 29 and it's very autobiographical with some uh, magical realism elements. 
and uh, they state, um, they view 29 as a kind of self-inventory. It's a way to examine yourself. It's like a get-to-know-you session. And you get to examine each other, too. Like when you're doing the animations, trying to learn the mannerisms of the other person. So, again, this is uh, the part that I really like the most about this is the tr trying to learn the mannerisms of the other person, paying attention, because that's what you're also doing when creating a game. You might think, oh, okay, there's a certain experience and there's many things that are happening, but you have to somehow boil it down to something that a person can play. So you have to just pick out just core mechanics out of it and that kind of helps you uh, see clearer. Um, this um, is just a screenshot of an uh, article from Kill Screen. Uh, recently, uh, the self-care game jam took place and um, uh, during a game jam, people just like make a game really quickly in a week, sometimes a month, sometimes 24 hours. And in, in this uh, case, it was all about making small games that made you feel better. And so it's not just about mechanics of decon like about mechanics and deconstructing um, feelings that were negative and so on, and experiences that were negative. It's also about encouraging you to make um, games about things that are positive. So uh, one of the quotes in this article is, uh, the process of creating something can be a form of self-care by itself. So uh, making games can be cathartic because uh, sometimes when I'm like, okay, I've got this thing in my head, it's like all over the place, I don't really know how to sort it out. I sometimes get uh, a good idea of how I could translate that. And because I've got prototyping tools such as Twine and Construct that make it really easy for me, I just sit down and have like an intense brainstorming session and end up making a game in just like a couple of hours. But like this whole idea of sitting down and really processing through it like at once like that and being completely focused on something kind of helps me figure it out and just move on and just fully process it and let go at some points. And um, yeah, games can also be about healing. Uh, uh, some of the games made for the self-care jam are very calm, relaxing and abstract, but they're still very deeply personal. Uh, I've been advised to call these uh, duplos. Uh, I, I call them the Lego blocks or Legos, but okay, to each their own. Um, <laughs> it, it, you might ask yourself, okay, you're boiling down uh, mechanic like experiences into mechanics. But so far, I've been like really like pushing on the whole idea of just you know a few core mechanics and so on. Like it seems a bit over oversimplified. Like how can you reduce mental health to just like I don't know two variables or, and so on, like it seems like this doesn't make sense. But uh, it might seem con t counterintuitive at first too, but when you think about it, uh, like the brain for example is made up of atoms that just kind of interact with each other and of course the brain is complex and mental health is complex, but so you can't actually scope down everything to, to just a few mechanics. So that's why personal games do focus on usually just like, like a very specific aspect of a certain experience. And what they do is that they build up. So using blocks, they, um, they take mechanics, uh, variables, like if you think about what now, walking, but then also the feedback of it, like the, it's very simple things and programming wise it's quite simple, but the way it adds everything up, that's what cre creates the complexity and the brain is really not that different fra from it, like in how it works. So um, an example, again, um, this is a very, very um, good game. It was uh, the first game that um, um, the game developer uh, Merit Coppas made. And um, it, because of the fact that she didn't have much technical knowledge, it is very, very simple. Uh, so you're this uh, square and you can walk around, you have the walls um, and you have these other characters. And so you just have the two mechanics. So you can walk around, so obviously you kind of understand, okay, the idea is to get to the end. Um, but you can also zoom into yourself. So the problem is when you start the game, you're fine. You're just moving around. But when you get to a zone that has different uh, blocks, uh, different um, rectangles, if they are of a different color than you, they start getting kind of aggressive. They start like pushing you around and like pushing you back to uh, the location you were at before. So what you can do is that you can uh, hold Z and that will just zoom into you, like slowly zoom into you and also change your color to the color of the, the other blocks in that room. But as you start moving around and just obviously no one is like annoyed at you, like all the blocks are fine. As you move around, the, 
it just continues zooming into you and like you move just slightly slower and it's just, it, it makes you uncomfortable. And again, like it's kind of like, I think each one of us can kind of relate to th this to one experience or the other. And um, uh, it's, again, it's very simple in its mechanics, but it just works. And the reason why it works is because it's, um, in this case, it's about a trade-off. It's about balancing two things, either being um, open about your identity, but having people sometimes be abusive towards you, or then kind of trying to fit in, but that actually uh, ultimately being harmful to you. Um, so that, that can be a very powerful storytelling element, and it's literally just weighing two things. Um, yeah. So um, we have been talking uh, a bunch about developers and um, obviously seeing things under a game lens, boiling down things to the core elements and figuring out how to translate things into mechanics and so on, so on. But I haven't really looked at players that much, so that's why I'm going back to this slide and just going to talk a bit more about how us as players can actually um, also have a form of self-care when playing games. So, um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning with the whole games are about figuring things out, that also obviously applies to players. Um, and so when you're um, trying to figure out a game for yourself, that's when it really, like th that for me is really the benefit of games as a medium, is that you, you have to figure out things for yourself, so you're experiencing something from the perspective of another person, and you have to play around, like with what now, what now, which is my next slide, um, you, you're not told what to do, and you just kind of know what things you can and cannot do by just walking around and figuring uh, out what the reactions are of the different objects to you. And because of the fact that you're trying to, well, kind of win or like figure out the game, you kind of put yourself in a mentality of, okay, uh, I need objects to get close to me so that I feel better. If I move around too much, that's problematic. And uh, that's why games work so well for empathy is that generally speaking, you're kind of putting uh, yourself into someone else's shoes and you have a certain toolkit that you can use uh, to solve problems. So uh, in the case of games relating to mental health, that often is about um, giving uh, the players a toolkit of like coping mechanisms and so on and putting them in a situation where they might have troubles or, or have to wait certain variables and then the players just kind of like, oh, okay, uh, I don't know how this is, I've never experienced this, but you know, I'm gonna try to figure things out and then they just have those little, you know, ding moments where they realize like how things are and so on and how it feels to be someone else. So um, yeah, I've mostly, I guess, talked uh, about this. So um, what's uh, useful is that it's not just obviously for people who have not gone through a certain experience. Like obviously it's useful for them because figuring things out, um, they, they, they have to think in a specific way that they haven't done before, but it's also useful for people who have gone through an experience similar. Uh, so in the case of what now, you kind of see how someone else represented, like in this case, a panic attack, and you're kind of able to either feel like you're understood, uh, feeling like you're not alone that, and that other people experience things in a very similar way to you, or you can just kind of just generally have a conversation with the developer too about uh, this. So uh, games can actually be a starting point for a conversation. So um, uh, I, 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 I like wrote a very good line, so I'm very proud of it. It's, uh, so it's either the feeling of being understood or the feeling of understanding. So uh, copyright, you know, trademark. <laughs> um, so um, this is uh, one of the... Uh, last games I want to uh, talk about. So uh, I believe this was actually made during the self-care jam. And so uh, who here has heard about the spoon theory? Yes. Good. I, I don't think uh, at any other conference uh, I would have that many <laughs> hands raised up. But so uh, the most interesting part for me is uh, obviously not just benefits for developers and benefits for players, but the actual intersection of those two. So uh, in case you don't know, the spoon theory is about, it's like a visibility metaphor used to explain the reduced amount of energy available for activities during the day. This was from Wikipedia, so I think it's, I think it's very good as a, as a general explanation. So uh, games can serve as communication, as I alluded to before. Uh, sometimes it's just hard to talk to people, and 
when you're a game designer, you might be very good at just taking things and translating them into mechanics. So sometimes it's just so useful to just kind of make a small thing and then be like, here you go, play the thing, you can feel what I feel, without actually having to engage in like a direct conversation with the person. So um, it's, it's uh, because of the fact that it's a less direct way of communicating, it can sometimes be easier to say things that are hard to say because it's kind of like, oh, the player's actually making the choices. Not, I'm not really imposing anything on them, so it makes it a bit you know, easier. Um, and uh, players might interpret mechanics in interesting ways. So uh, let's say in a game like this, they might obviously like understand the core idea of the spoon theory and so on, but they might go, oh, uh, I wonder why, let's say you put uh, like that object in that specific location, like it seems very like forwards. And you might have not realized that you were doing that as you were designing it because you felt, oh, I'm just gonna you know, put things randomly. And that actually sometimes helps you understand more about yourself and why you did certain decisions because it, it, it is a uh, very uh, like eye-opening to go through the design process, but at the same time, sometimes you don't even notice certain aspects that you're doing of it. So uh, this is kind of similar to uh, writing a diary in that sometimes you write a diary and you're like, okay, well, I just, I'm just writing my feelings. But then after a few months, you look back at it and you're like, that's why I was feeling like really bad. There were like that, that, and that, like as factors that affected like how could I not have seen that? And when making a game, you kind of have this like external thing that kind of encompasses how you thought about those mechanics and how they relate to each other. So uh, I think yeah, that's that's it for that slide. So um, I'd obviously like to talk uh, a bit more about like linearity in games in this kind of like personal game, whether you know you should give lots of agency to the player, or whether if it's a really specific personal experience, it's better not to give them too much agency, uh, realism and so on, but I kind of am running out of time. So, you know. So, um, one last thing I wanted to mention is that um, whether it's uh, having a nice stroll uh, through the woods or losing your scarf, we all have small stories and interesting stories that are worth sharing, and they might help us process, but they might even have the nice side effect of helping others, um, uh, either by allowing them to understand or by just helping them relate. So uh, next time when you feel the need to unwind, think about making a small game. Thank you.